Hi, my name is Chris Didigian. I'm a research computing infrastructure geek employed by the bio team. Today I will be providing a quick overview of how to launch your own Amazon Spot instances as a traditional Linux cluster or compute farm. The infrastructure we will be deploying actually mimics very, very closely what is commonly found in our own local high-performance computing environments, and it's actually a great fit on the cloud for applications, pipelines, and analytical work streams that we really don't intend to rewrite or completely re-architect for the cloud. Spot instances on Amazon are actually a great way of bidding for unused EC2 capacity at a very steep discount. Historically, customers have received discounts between 50 and 66 percent off of the hourly on-demand costs, and there is no long-term or upfront commitment like you would need if you wanted a reserved instance. The trade-off, of course, is that your spot instance can be interrupted and reclaimed by Amazon if the spot price exceeds your bid price. One of my goals for today is actually to show you that the interruptible nature of spot instances is actually far less scary than it appears, and running compute farms on spot instances can be very advantageous for a number of use cases. This is actually kind of a secret bio team best practice. We do do a lot of testing, prototyping, and long-term low-priority scientific calculations on the spot instance platform. One additional piece of software we'll be using for this demo is a piece of open source code from the MIT STAR project called STAR Cluster. STAR Cluster is a fantastic and easy to use product capable of automatically deploying the servers, software, and network services we need in order to have a functional cluster. If you have never built a Linux cluster from scratch before, it may be hard to comprehend how fantastic Star Cluster really is. The developers have completely automated dozens of complex provisioning and configuration actions into a single-click cluster-building powerhouse. All right, enough talking. Let's actually get some work done. Now, I fired up a small on-demand T1 micro instance simply because my laptop already has the dependencies installed, and I wanted to start fresh when uh, when showing the installation. So this is my uh, brand new Amazon Linux server. And um, just in the interest of clarity, we're going to alter the prompt so that we can distinguish when I'm typing on the client system versus the star cluster that we plan on firing up. So the next thing we need to do is make sure that there's a couple of dependencies that we know Star Cluster is going to require. Um, I want to make sure the Python development tools as well as the text editor are on this system. Excellent. So we got a few dependencies installed. Let's go ahead and see if we can download Star Cluster. Okay, we've got our software installed. Let's see if this is actually going to work. The first thing we'll do is we'll run the star cluster client in a way that generates a configuration file that we can alter and customize as needed. The star cluster configuration file we created is almost but not quite ready to work out of the box. There's a little bit of information we, the user, have to provide. I've uploaded that to my server so that I can reference it in the configuration file. The first set of data is it actually needs my AWS keys, the AWS key and the AWS secret key. It also needs the uh, EC2 SSH private key so we can log in to servers that it's starting and issue configuration commands. With that information, we can now reference it in our configuration. The configuration file itself is very straightforward, it's very well documented. The vast majority of parameters you won't have to change if you're just experimenting or kicking the tires. We simply need to go through and change the three or four lines that reference a particular credential, access identifier, or SSH key. A good way of testing and seeing if your star cluster configuration file works is actually seeing if we can use it to pull spot history pricing data out of Amazon. Here I'm going to try to pull out the spot pricing history for M1 extra large instances over the last 30 days. Very good. It looks like we have a fairly consistent price of about 24 cents per hour on the spot market. Let's try to put some context around the 24 cents uh, reported for the M1 extra large instance. If we go over and look at what Amazon is charging for on demand, we find that it is more than 50% cheaper than the on-demand instance for the M1 Extra Large itself. And even more interesting, that $0.24 cents figure is even smaller than what Amazon is charging per hour for a server with half the memory and half the CPU capacity. The other thing that's interesting to note is that the price has been relatively stable over long periods of time. It's, qu it's quite easy to understand that if we bid a few pennies above $0.24, cents, say even $0.25, cents, we would very likely get all of the servers we would want for days or possibly weeks at a time. This, my friend, is the secret of the spot instance market. With a little bit of research into the spot pricing history and a little bit of uh, accurate guessing, it's very, very easy to get incredibly inexpensive resources for as long as you actually need them. 
Knowing what we know about the historical pricing for an M1 extra large instance on the spot market, I'm quite confident that if I put in a bid for 25 cents an hour, I would get all the servers I want for basically as long as I want. Nine and a half minutes later, we have a four node 20 CPU Linux cluster running in the cloud for 50% less than we'd pay if we did this via the on-demand EC2 instances. Let's log in and take the new cluster for a spin. All right, we've logged into our master node. The first command we'll use is qstat. This is a grid engine command that shows us the state and status of our system. This is looking good. Uh, we've got all four nodes in the master node. We've got 20 processors total. The jobs, the nodes are configured to run batch, interactive, or parallel tasks, and there are no unusual errors or error conditions. Another command, qhost, shows us roughly similar information, just formatted slightly differently. So let's quickly fire off a couple of jobs. One of the, the nice interactive job commands on this type of cluster is qrsh. And we're going to run the bin hostname command just to prove that we're executing on different nodes in the cluster each time we run this interactive command. That's enough of the quick test. Let's become a non-root user and actually submit something a tiny bit more substantial. I'm now the SG admin user. We'll just refresh our QStat output and try to submit some Wira work. As we can see here, I've caught the cluster in a nice state. We've got three of our simple job scripts actually running on compute nodes 1, 3, and 4, and I've got the remainder of my jobs pending. They're actually pending, and by now, if I refresh QStat, they'll actually be running. Here we go. They're actually running, if not already complete. All right, we've still got a few left to run, and if we take a look in our home directory, we actually will see the standard error and standard output files for the jobs that I've submitted to the grid. So I think that's it. That's enough of a simple introduction. I, have, I don't have the time to go over all of the fantastic parallel environments, numerical libraries, and other tools that Star Cluster installs, but let's just say we have a fully functional, ready-to-use cluster in nine minutes that we built using Amazon Spot instances. So I'll quickly log out here. With that quick tour over, let's shut down our cluster. That's the end of our tour. Thank you very much.